Is Christian Zionism really Christian? Many evangelicals believe it is. After all, Scripture says God gave Israel to the Jewish people as an inheritance. And he told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. But a growing number of evangelicals oppose Zionism. They say the movement confuses biblical prophecy with Israeli nationalism and furthers oppression of the Palestinian people. Good morning. I'm Julie Royce, and this is Up for Debate. Joining me this morning is Dr. Stephen Sizer, an author, pastor, and leading evangelical opponent of Zionism. However, defending Zionism will be Dr. Michael Brown, a prolific author and one of the world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologists. Drs. Brown and Sizer join us in just a moment, but first, here's what some of you think about Christian Zionism. I definitely believe that they're the chosen people and that we're supposed to support them, but that their government isn't necessarily following what God wants them to do, and that God loves the Palestinians just as much as he loves everyone else. So the situation over there is way more complicated than most Christians want to believe. I do believe that the Lord chose Israel as his people, so Israel does have a really important role in history and in God's Plan. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense in my mind to fervently support any nation, including the Israeli nation, that reject our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, the modern day Israeli nation even passes laws that deny Christians the ability to do evangelism. So, I mean, why would we support anything like that? Whatever you think is the correct side of it, the things we do and the things we choose to do affect other people. And I think about Abraham's mistake about not trusting God, and and it has affected generations upon generations and millions of people because he chose to do it his way instead of God's way. Whenever the conflict comes up in the news or people talk about it, I think about that in my own life. I need to follow God's ways in everything I do, lest it affect others as well. Hmm. Well, there obviously are a variety of opinions on Zionism in support of Israel, but which view is correct? Are the Jews still God's chosen people? Does modern Israel have spiritual significance, or is it merely a secular state? And does supporting Israel mean ignoring the plight of the Palestinians? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts. The number to call is 877-LIVE-675. That's 877-548-3675. Again, I'm Julie Royce, and you're listening to Up for Debate. And perhaps you're new to this topic, and you're wondering, just what is Christian Zionism? Well, Throughout this program, I think you'll get a much more thorough understanding of the term. But in a nutshell, Christian Zionism is the belief that the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Most Christian Zionists also believe that the ingathering of the Jews in Israel is a signpost pointing to the second coming of Jesus, and that it's every Christian's responsibility to actively support the state of Israel. Well, joining me this morning are two evangelical leaders who are very passionate about this issue, but they hold opposite views. Opposing Zionism is Dr. Stephen Sizer. Dr. Sizer is the vicar of Christ Church in Surrey, England. He's also the vice president of Biblical Europe Ministries Trust, a ministry sponsor and publisher of the New International Version, but perhaps most pertinent to our discussion this morning Dr. Sizer has written several books about Zionism, including Zion's Christian Soldiers and Christian Zionism. So, Dr. Sizer, good morning, and welcome to Up for Debate. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Sizer, as I understand it, uh, your objections to Zionism are both theological and political, and we'll definitely delve into some of your political objections in a minute. But first, would you explain why you disagree with Zionism theologically? Yes, um... Zionism is a political um, viewpoint that does see Israel as much more than simply a nation state. Zionism, especially as it is manifest today, sees itself as a state for the Jewish people, and therefore it inevitably treats non-Jewish citizens as second-class citizens or even as non-citizens. It's therefore has, it therefore has much a greater uh, parallel with attempts in South Africa to create a white uh, apartheid regime. The parallels are quite uh, clear in my mind and the mind of many others. Um, I don't oppose the, the existence of a state 
a Jewish state uh, or even uh, a state for all its citizens. But Israel's got to make up its mind as to whether it's going to be one state for all its citizens uh, or two states, uh, one for Jews and one for Palestinians. Um, Theologically, Zionism is not something that the Bible teaches us, I believe. Um, The nature of Israel as a people in the Old Testament, as much as in the New Testament, was an inclusive people on the basis of faith, not race. Today, Zionism manifests itself primarily as a state based on race, not faith, and therefore I see it as having no uh, parallel with uh, God's people in the Scriptures. Okay, and you would say that the establishment of the state of Israel, a lot of people would point to that, say, God said in the Old Testament as a punishment for their disobedience, that he would scatter the Israelites. But then it also talks about this uh, regathering of the Israelites. A lot of people point to that and say, this was a fulfillment of prophecy in 1948. You would say that doesn't have spiritual significance. Is that correct? And would you explain why? Well, I would be agnostic. Um, We suffer from what's called chronological snobbery. We think basically that our generation is the most important one that's ever existed. If you look at history, you'll find Christians seeking to interpret prophecy in the light of uh, the news uh, uh, of their day. So Napoleon was the Antichrist. Gorbachev was the Antichrist. Uh, Charles Dyer's book, uh, one of his books, suggests that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. Then it became... um, uh, Osama bin Laden, then it became um, uh, Ahmadinejad. Uh, you know, we, we forget failed prophecies, and we focus on what we believe um, makes sense for our generation. Um, th- the prophecies about the return to the land were always predicated on repentance. The pattern, both in the prophets as much as in the law, was obey and you can stay, rebel and you're out. Uh, repent and you can return. And uh, God's people returned out of exile uh, under Ezra and Nehemiah, but they returned in repentance, and they were explicitly told to share the land with the foreigners who'd come to faith in the one true God. So I I am skeptical about uh, trying to date events such as Mm. 1948 or 1967 biblically, because it flies in the face of the consistent teaching of all the prophets, which was that the return to the land would be predicated on repentance. And I do not see the Jewish people uh, repenting and believing in Jesus. Okay. Well, also joining me this morning is Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Brown is a Jewish believer in Jesus. He's also the host of the nationally syndicated Line of Fire radio broadcast, and he's the president of the Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina. Dr. Brown also teaches Bible and Hebrew studies at several leading seminaries, and he's written nearly two dozen books. So, Dr. Brown, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Uh, Dr. Brown, you heard what Dr. Sizer just said uh, about whether or not Israel today has spiritual significance, whether 1948, the establishment of the state of Israel, uh, is a fulfillment of prophecy or not. I'm curious, how do you respond to that? Sure. I might agree with a couple of specific points that were made along the way, but categorically differ both theologically and and politically. In, In short, God scattered the Jewish people in judgment, and we see in Scripture that what God curses, no one can bless. When God shuts the door, no one can open it. And the only way that we've been regathered, if we were scattered in divine judgment, the only way we've been regathered to the land is because God chose to regather us. That's, that's not uh, being a rocket scientist to be able to recognize that. In point of fact, in times past, 2,500 years ago, during the time of the Babylonian exile, when we were in sin, God said he was bringing us back to the land despite our uncleanness because his name was being blasphemed. So I bow down to a sovereign God who works things according to his purposes. And in point of fact, uh, Isaiah 62 never changed, God telling us to pray for Jerusalem, that it would be a light of the whole earth. Psalm 122 never changed. The fact that Jesus will not return until Jewish Jerusalem welcomes him, Matthew 23, that's not changed. The fact that even in sin and under judgment, yes, Jews need Jesus to be saved like anyone else, but God reiterates in Romans 11 chapter, even though enemies for the gospel, they're still loved because of the promises to the fathers for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. This has nothing to do with racism. This has nothing to do with politics. This has to do exclusively with the faithfulness of God. He said in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, 
verses 35 to 37, that no matter what his people did, even if we'd be disciplined, still he would preserve us. We've been miraculously preserved. We've survived the Holocaust and everything else only by God's grace and goodness, none of our own goodness. He's now restored us back to the land. And in point of fact, uh, Arabs living in the land of Israel have more freedoms than, than anyone else. Our, uh, the, the Jewish state remains totally inclusive. In fact, the 200,000 refugees that remained in the land and listened to Israel's beckoning to remain in the land, they're now one and a half million people and vote and, and have a presence in the parliament, have a presence in the Supreme Court, uh, far more liberties than those living under the Palestinian Authority, and far, far more than living under Hamas. So when, when things like apartheid are mentioned, or unfortunately other terms that Dr. Saz has used in the past, like ethnic cleansing, they're inflammatory, dangerous, and uh, when we just look at it on a very simple level, I believe it remains true that if the Israelis were to put down their weapons, there'd be no more Israel. If the Palestinians were to put down their weapons, there'd be no more war. Israeli soldiers are trained in ethics right from the start. When there's a Palestinian child that's killed, it's a tragedy, and there's an investigation looking into it. When there's an Israeli child killed by Palestinian terrorists, that's a cause for rejoicing. So Dr. Saiz is on the wrong side of this in terms of justice. He's on the wrong side of this in terms of scripture, theology, and God's heart. And if we really care about the Palestinian people, then we need to stand with Israel, recognize what God is doing. Yes, for Israel's wrong, call them to account, but is standing with them, not against them, recognizing the purposes of God at work in this hour. Zechariah 12 speaks of the day when all nations will turn against Jerusalem. That tells me that there's some spiritual war going on, and we as followers of Jesus need to recognize the spiritual war, stand with justice, stand with what's right, and then stand together for justice for everyone in the Middle East. And I trust on that point, Dr. Sizer and I would agree. Dr. Sizer, Dr. Brown thinks you're on the wrong side of justice on this. How do you respond? Well, what I don't want to do with uh, in our conversation is mm-hmm. trade uh, comments with regard to you know politics um, or, or make inflammatory statements about the relative merits of living under Palestinian or Israeli rule. I think what what our listeners really want to grapple with is the, the concepts that we find in Scripture and uh, and, and base our uh, convictions on scripture rather than an interpretation of politics. Mm, and we are going to get to that in our next segment. We need to take a quick break. The number to call 877-548-3675. Again, I'm speaking with Dr. Michael Brown, one of the world's foremost Meth- Messianic Jewish apologists. Also, Dr. Stephen Sizer, a leading evangelical opponent of Christian Zionism. Moody Bible Institute's Day One is an opportunity for high school students and their parents to learn more about MBI's undergrad programs. You'll have a chance to interact with professors, take a tour, meet students, visit a class, and attend a chapel service. Gain a better understanding of the academic and spiritual life at MBI. Join us for Day One on November 15th. For details, go to moody.edu slash day one or call us at 312-329-4400. 312-329-4400. Where is it? Would you believe it? The TV remote controlled in the refrigerator? Huh? This is Norman Wilson, and it's true. More than half of Americans lose the remote control up to five times a week, and they often find it in the refrigerator. Cool. Probably left there during a dash for a snack during commercial. We're all guilty of doing things thoughtlessly, without the concentration of reason or the attention of our conscious mind. Usually that's no more troubling than losing the remote. But such negligence can have more serious results. Did you know the Bible says when you know to do good and don't do it, that's a sin? It's called a sin of omission. You see, a sin is not only doing what you know is wrong, it is failing to do what is right. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you would like information about how you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ and receive his free gift of eternal life, I would invite you to call 1-888-NEED-HIM. It's a salute to veterans on the next Midday Connection, and we've invited Dr. Gary Chapman and Jocelyn Green to talk about the five love languages from a military perspective. 
How can military couples grow closer in the midst of unique challenges like deployment, reintegration, and combat trauma? We'll take a look at how to express love when apart and how to speak the love languages in challenging times on the next Midday Connection. How Christian is Christian Zionism? Welcome back to Up for Debate. I'm Julie Royce, and if you're just joining our discussion and perhaps unfamiliar with that term, Christian Zionism is the belief that the establishment of the modern state of Israel was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and a sign that the second coming of Jesus is imminent. It's also a movement that encourages Christians to actively support the state of Israel. Joining me this morning to defend Christian Zionism is Dr. Michael Brown, a leading Messianic Jewish apologist, and challenging his view is Dr. Stephen Sizer, an author and activist who believes Christian support for Israel is actually perpetuating oppression of the Palestinian people. If you'd like to know more about either of my guests, you can go to upfordebate.org. Again, that's upfordebate.org. And while you're there, I encourage you to click on the Facebook icon and become part of our Facebook community where there's often simultaneous discussions going on uh, with the program. So I encourage you to do that. Also, I have two books available, Dr. Michael Brown's Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, um, a book documenting some of the atrocities against the Jewish people by Christians, uh, I think an important book for, for Christians to have. Uh, we have a copy of that and also Dr. Stephen Sizer's Christian Zionism on his view of the Christian Zionist movement. If you'd like to request a copy, just send us an email at upfordebate at moody.edu. Again, that's upfordebate at Moody. Uh, dot edu. I have a number of you on our phone line already to ask questions. The number 877-548-3675. We'll get to those in a minute. But first, uh, let's talk about this theologically, like Dr. Sizer uh, encouraged us to do. I want to talk about this term, the chosen people, um, and the promises made to Abraham by God. Uh, are those still in effect today with the state of Israel? Uh, Dr. Brown, what do you uh, say to that? Well, of, of course they are. And I, I do want to point out the issue of politics. When you ask Dr. Sizer for theology, he began with charges of apartheid. So that's what's inflammatory, and that's, that's what we need to recognize. But as far as the promises, of course they remain, because they're based on the faithfulness of God. Let's remember that the people of India and the people of China are as ancient as the people of Israel. They're, they're both over one billion people, and what, there may be 13, 14 million Jews in the world. So there has been a lot of difficulty, challenge, discipline through the centuries, being, quote, the chosen people. But again, when God made the, the land promise to Abram in Genesis 15, he made it as a one-way covenant, only God passing through the covenantal pieces. So this depends on the faithfulness of God. There are numerous Old Testament prophecies where you'd have to say God was a liar. God went back on his word. God changed the terms. God changed the recipients of the promises if the promises no longer apply. And again, simple text in Romans 11, 28, and 29, where Paul is laying out God's purposes for Israel, the mystery, what happened, the Messiah came, and his own people rejected him. And what does he say? First, there's a remnant within Israel, and Israel within Israel, and then he begins to speak of the nation as a whole, the people as a whole, ten straight times, culminating with a future promise of salvation, and saying, even though they're enemies now for the gospel's sake, they are still loved because of the patriarchs, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Either God is a liar and cannot be trusted, or his word is true. If he can't be trusted in his promises to Israel no matter what, then he can't be trusted in his promises to the church no matter what. Okay, Dr. Sizer, the argument, those promises made to Abraham, an everlasting covenant. In uh, Romans we see that God's elect, that that is irrevocable. So uh, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I agree entirely with the statements of Scripture, um, but I think Dr. Brown is conflating two things. He's equating Israel in the Old Testament with uh, a racial group that we would identify today as the Jewish people, and I think that this is, uh, uh, this is um, incorrect. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, well, first of all, in relation to the promise God made to Abraham about blessing and cursing in Genesis chapter 12, the promise was made to Abraham and no one else. Uh, and if it's inappropriate to apply the promise to Israel, um, when he promises uh, that other nations will be blessed through his seed, 
in Genesis 22, it's very important that we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, the promises are spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And then in verses 28 and 29, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, nor male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promises God made to Abraham are fulfilled in and through the followers of Jesus, Jews and Gentiles. And like Dr. Brown, I pray and, and hope for the uh, conversion or the completion of the faith of every Jewish person in our world today, that they come to trust and believe in Jesus as their Messiah. But when we start talking about chosen people, the word chosen in the New Testament is used exclusively of followers of Jesus. And this is entirely consistent with the Hebrew Scriptures, because they say exactly the same thing. Let's give you a couple of examples. Psalm 87, 4 to 6, in three verses, three times, God says, um, this one was born in Zion, and he specifically refers to the African, to the Iraqis, to the Lebanese, the Palestinian, and the Egyptians. And he says, if they believe in me, they were born in Zion. It's as if they were born in Zion. They're born spiritually. And in Isaiah 56, God anticipates the racial prejudice uh, of those who believe that Abraham was their father when he says, let no foreigner who's banned themselves to the Lord, say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Well, why would foreigners think that they were being excluded from the people when God says they mustn't say that? It was because uh, God's people were doing the excluding. And the term Jew in the Old Testament does not mean racially descended from Abraham. Um, Just give you one example, Esther 8, verse 17. Uh, after the glorious deliverance of God's people out of, uh, out of the, um, the hands of those who wanted to destroy the Jewish people, verse 8, 17 says that many other nations became Jews out of fear of the Jews, recognizing what God was doing. So by the time of Esther, the Jewish people were made up of many nationalities. And I would suggest from that verse that those who could trace their physical descent back to Abraham were already by a minority within the Jewish people. So it's not surprising when we get to the New Testament in Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 9 that Paul defines Jew in spiritual terms and he defines Israel in spiritual terms. So I have no problem with the promises. I apply them today to the followers of Jesus, Jews and Gentiles, and I do pray that, that every Jew will come to an understanding that enables them to be grafted back into the vine into which we have been grafted as, uh, as Gentiles. Okay, Dr. Brown, let me allow you to uh, answer that. Sure. With all respect, Dr. Sizer, you completely undermined every point you made with your statement that you're praying for Jews to be saved. Well, who, who are Jews then? We agree there's an identifiable people in the earth today that God has preserved. No, not everyone can trace themselves back to Abram, but let's remember it's been very difficult to be a Jew through history. There's been scattering, there's been persecution, this has hardly been a popular thing, so it's always included others, and the modern state of Israel does to this day. So Esther 8 does not negate that, Isaiah 56 does not negate that. Rather, uh, it is reiterated by the fact that God has preserved a specific people to whom he gave specific promises, and for example, in, in Psalm 105, What's uh, Psalm, 1, yeah, Psalm 105, what's reiterated there is that these promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Israel, so this is an identifiable people, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. And he says that it is an everlasting covenant. Either God's word is trustworthy or it's not. Of course there's an identifiable people on the earth. That's what we're talking about. No one said that everyone is ethnically traceable back to Abraham, but that this is the people that descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have consisted primarily of the physical descendants and others can join to them. What troubles me, though, is you'll take an interpretation where Paul is making a homiletical point, Galatians 3, talking about seed, plural, which is never used for people in the Bible. It's always a collective if it's talking about the people. He's making, he is making a point about 
one specific seed, namely the Messiah, as far as Messianic promises, but not in terms of promises to the people and the nation. And as you quote it within the very same chapter in Galatians, he now turns around and uses the same word in the plural. As far as Romans 2, he's saying, who's the real Jew? The, the real Jew is not just one outwardly, but one inwardly. And now what does he do in the very next verse, in the, in the third chapter, the first verse? He says, okay, then what's the, the reason for being a Jew? What's the advantage? What's the purpose of circumcision? Of course he's talking about Jewish people. Uh, and in Romans 9, he talks about a remnant, Israel, within Israel. He's not talking about Gentiles. There is talking about Jewish believers. That's the Israel within Israel. And then ten more times for the rest of the chapter, he's talking about the nation as a whole. The promises remain to the nation as a whole. And as far as chosenness, it's interesting that the term is used in First Peter, of course, as well, uh, for chosen ones, and that's the Jewish believers in Jesus. So, yes, we agree that ultimate chosenness is in Jesus, but the fact that God made promises to a people and that there's a redemptive purpose to this, this all has to do with God's purposes through Jesus. This all has to do with God's love for the entire world. And Paul is explicit in Romans 11 that if the rejection of this people, everyone recognizes who this people is, if their rejection means riches for the world, what will their regathering mean back to the Messiah? But life from the dead. So this is one of the great signs to the world that God is still at work, that those he scattered, he regathered. There is no other explanation for the Jewish people being back in the land other than that God regathered us, and it is for his spiritual and eternal purposes. And again, I would argue passionately that for the side of justice, we need to be standing with Israel as well, and standing with them for justice for the Palestinians and all in the Middle East. But standing with Israel, recognizing God's distinct purposes for Israel, is important missiologically for the salvation of the world. And Jesus says he will not return until the Jewish Jerusalem welcomes him back. There must be an identifiable people. Luke 21, Jerusalem trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, scattering of Jews until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. God knows the specific details, but certainly the regathering is part of God's timetable on the earth unfolding and encourages us in the ongoing progress of the Great Commission. You know, we've talked about the regathering biblically and some of the scriptures that are there. I think there's also an argument, and Michael, you hinted at this, but just that this has never happened before. An ancient people group, when they are scattered for 2,000 years, they lose their identity. The Philistines have lost their identity. We, the Moabites, you know, all these people that we see listed in Scripture, they've scattered. We, we don't have them today except the ones that have a homeland, like the Persians. Those would be the Iranians or the Greeks. But the Jews, scattered everywhere, came back together and established a state really against all odds. Nothing like this has ever happened before. How do we explain that apart from the move of God? Dr. Steven Sizer, I know you want to answer that when we come back, so I will uh, allow you to do that. Also, I want to get to your questions as well. We have a number of you on the line, 877-548-3675. We'll get to your questions when we come back again, 877-LIVE-675. We took a microphone to the streets of downtown Chicago and asked, what do you want out of life? I think just to be happy, be fulfilled. Be happy. Just be happy. Stay happy, live happy, die happy. That's it. To find complete and eternal happiness. Unfortunately, happiness in this world is elusive. Want true happiness? Pursue Jesus Christ. This is Moody Radio. Hi, I'm Dennis Ramey, host of Family Life Today. Throughout my years of ministry, I've witnessed the pain and pressure that drug abuse has on families. Hi, my name's Jeremy. I just started using even harder when I turned 14. I got addicted to a lifestyle. When I started hurting the people that I loved, I knew I had hit rock bottom. Teen Challenge was my avenue to finding Jesus Christ in my life and getting me sober. My mom and my dad, they come and see me. They see the change in me. I don't have to tell them I'm changed out of a jail cell anymore. I'm I'm showing them. I'm living it in front of them. If you or your loved one needs help, my friends at Moody Radio encourage you to consider Teen Challenge. For more than 50 years, they've been helping both teens and adults find a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. You can learn more by calling 417-581-2181 or by visiting TeenChallengeUSA.com. 
Revealing Hope Ministries of Elgin wants to perk you up every day with one of their single-origin Colombian coffees. You get great coffee from their coffee ministry, Aroma of Hope, and all of the proceeds make a positive global impact for the children in Colombia through spiritual encouragement and education. Make a positive impact for those underserved in Colombia. Go to revealinghope.org. After you make your coffee selection, take a moment to learn about Revealing Hope Ministries. That's revealinghope.org. This message is brought to you by Revealing Hope Ministries. With SRN News, I'm Bob Agnew in Washington. At least 138 people now confirmed dead in the aftermath of a typhoon that slammed into six central Philippine islands yesterday. The death toll is expected to climb. The Philippine Interior Secretary says officials expect a very high number of fatalities from one of the strongest typhoons on record. A deal regarding Iran's nuclear program continues to elude negotiators in Geneva. French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabiou says world powers remain split on the terms because of differences on ways to reduce Tehran's ability to make atomic weapons. A Miami Herald executive says the newspaper is very concerned over the detention of one of its journalists in Venezuela. Jim Weiss is the newspaper's Andean bureau chief. He was detained on Thursday by the National Guard in San Cristobal. On Wall Street, the Dow thrived Friday up 168 points. This is SRN News. Does the nation of Israel have spiritual significance, or is it simply a modern secular state? Welcome back to Up for Debate. I'm Julie Royce, and today we're discussing Christian Zionism. That's the belief that the establishment of the state of Israel is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy and a sign heralding Christ's second coming. Many evangelicals hold this belief, though a growing number do not. They charge the movement confuses biblical prophecy with Israeli nationalism and perpetuates oppression of Palestinians. I'd love to get to your calls, 877-548-3675. We'll do that in a minute. Or you can email us at upfordebate at moody.edu. That's upfordebate at Moody. Dot edu. You also can request uh, Dr. Brown's book, Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, or Dr. Stephen Sizer's Christian Zionism. Uh, if you just send us an email with your address, uh, we can get those out to you. Again, just a limited number of copies of those, but uh, we'll give them to whoever requests them first. Again, joining me this morning are two leading apologists on opposite sides of this debate. Dr. Michael Brown is a Jewish believer in Jesus, a passionate defender of Christian Zionism. Dr. Stephen Sizer is an Anglican vicar and a passionate opponent of Zionism. So, uh, Dr. Sizer, before the break, I posed the question, you know, just from a practical argument, just seeing the regathering of this this nation of Israel, these people, uh, you know, with Jewish descent who have been scattered all over um, the earth, and then after 2,000 years— came back and reestablished a state. Never happened before in the history of mankind. How would you explain that outside of a sovereign move of God? The problem with that logic is that uh, it sounds very convincing because we're relying on our own experience. When you read uh, theological works from the 1930s from uh, dispensational writers, you find them speculating about how the Holocaust or the emerging Holocaust, the persecution of Jews, especially in uh, in uh, pre-war Germany, uh, how this could be interpreted prophetically. Um, so if we were debating this in the 1930s, we would be arriving at very different conclusions uh, because we would be dogmatizing about how this verse or that verse might make sense of the newspapers. Um, I mean, the reality is there are many peoples in our world who still exist without um, a homeland, the Armenians, the Kurds, and there are many others who have survived in history through periods of persecution and scattering who still have an identity. And I'm not denying that identity to Jewish people today who believe that uh, they are descended from Abraham. All I'm simply saying is that there are in Scripture plenty of passages that show that the Jewish people in the Hebrew Scriptures was made up of many nationalities, and that God encouraged those of faith of other nationalities, in a sense, to take on uh, Israeli citizenship. When we come to the land, uh, it's very important that we understand who the land was for. 
um, in, in the Torah, the, uh, God insists in Leviticus that the land belongs to him and that his people were foreigners and strangers. Uh, when they came back out of um, exile under Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezekiel 47, verses 21 to 23, again, in three verses, three times, God says, share the land with the foreigners. Share the land with those who trusted in me from other nations. You are to distribute the land to yourselves, uh, and you are to give it as an inheritance to the foreigners residing among you. So the land was to be shared. Um, why does God have to say something three times? Because these people wouldn't believe him. Okay. What the New Testament? Can oh. I just add one, one more verse? From okay. The New Testament. Thank you. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 is really the best place to go to in the New Testament to understand a theology of the land. Uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, By faith Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, exactly how God had deemed him in Leviticus. Um, goes on to say, As Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of the same promise, but the promise was not fulfilled in the land, for he was looking forward, it says, to a better country, a heavenly one. And then the end of Hebrews 11 says, So that only together with us, would they be made perfect, meaning the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints are made perfect in the new heaven and the new earth. So that the land was merely a temporary location uh, through which God's redemptive plan for the world could take place, the coming of a Messiah through a people. Um, but after the Lord had ascended to heaven, his disciples were instructed to take that good news to the world, but they were never told to come back. The good news of the gospel was the whole world, and and the whole world becomes uh, the residence, if you like, for his people. So I, that's why I have grave reservations about uh, dogmatizing about what God might be doing today in Israel, mm -hmm. and by conflating Zionism with uh, the biblical uh, land or people of the Jewish uh, Okay, faith. and it would be your position that that's more people taking current events and then reading that back into the scriptures? Exactly. exactly. Okay. I, I we've, just... done it through his, we've done it through history and the Reformation, the Crusades. They believed that they were doing gospel, yeah. that prophecy was coming true. Right. And there certainly is an element of that, and, and we've done that quite a bit, I would, I would agree. However, I would say, and my grandpa would be one of those who, before it was in vogue to say that the regathering... Uh, that God would bring the Jews back to the state of Israel. He used to teach this when it wasn't in vogue before 1948, and people thought he was a crackpot for doing that. But he just read the Old Testament and said, God's going to bring them back. That's what it says. Um, so I think there was a group of people before this even happened saying that God was going to bring the, the Jews back to the state of Israel. Correct, Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown? Uh, and again, I, with all respect to Dr. Sizer, I, I find this misuse of Scripture, especially New Testament Scripture, uh, utterly shocking. Again, God scattered, who can regather? Only God. Mm. It's God's land, and when he brings his people back, Dr. Sizer has a hard time with that. Uh, it's, it's utterly bizarre to me. The Puritans looked forward, many of them, to the regathering of the Jewish people to the land. Charles Spurgeon spoke of the regathering of the Jewish people to the land. As God does it, the only explanation, and the Kurds are meaning, there's no possible comparison to that for the Jewish people being scattered for all this period of time and then regathered back to the land. You're absolutely right. It has no historic precedent. The same God who preserved the Jewish people is the same God who regathered it's the inescapable conclusion of Scripture. I'm not a dispensationalist. I'm not a date setter. I'm completely against that. I just look at what God is doing in broad, large terms that are so large, they're impossible to, to miss. And the idea that the Great Commission, telling the 11 disciples to go into all the world and make disciples, means that the Jewish people no longer need a homeland is mind-boggling. Yes, it's always been temporary in light of the ultimate new heaven and new earth, and that's all we're talking about right now, is a place for the Jewish people to live. As to point to Hebrews 11 as a theology of the land, of course not. Are you going to say the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't care about the land? The reason Abraham lived in a tent was because God said, you're going to be exiles, and then after 400 years, I'll establish you in the land. But these were looked at as major promises, and the Jewish people were living in the land when these promises were given. As far as being inclusive, here... David Ben-Gurion, 1937, we do not wish and do not need to expel Arabs and take their place. All our aspiration is built on the assumption, 
proven throughout all our activity in the land of Israel that there is enough room in the country for ourselves and the Arabs. The Arab leaders in 1947 said, let's destroy the Jews, let's kill them, it'll be a massacre in history that'll be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. This is Azam Pasha, October 1947, Golden Meir, after the, the uh, UN partition plan accepted by Israel, we are happy and ready for what lies ahead. Our hands are extended in peace to our neighbors. Both states can live in peace with one another and cooperate for the welfare of their inhabitants. David Ben-Gurion, in December 1947, if the Arab citizen will feel at home in our state, if the state will help them in a truthful and dedicated way to reach the economic, social, and cultural level of the Jewish community, then Arab distrust will accordingly subside and the bridge will be built to a Semitic Jewish-Arab alliance. Let's remember that there are a million and a half Arabs living in Israel, voting with a presence in the parliament, with a presence in the Supreme Court, treat it fairly, treat it kindly, with more rights than any other Arabs in any other Middle East state. That tells you Israel's heart. Israelis do not enjoy sending all of their sons and daughters into war. They long for peace as most Palestinians do. It is the Islamic leadership that's standing in the way of this. It's the Islamic theology that cannot see Israel back in the land. That's All right. I'm going to need to cut you off because we have to go to break. And I have so many people on the phone lines, 877-548-3675. When we come back, we'll go directly to your calls, and you can ask these gentlemen questions yourselves. Join us for the next Treasure Truth as we begin to explore what it means to speak the truth in love. That is, okay, now as we're communicating and we're trying to solve a problem, we attack the problem. So there's some certain things we got to do. What kind of things we got to do, Pastor? Well, for example, I have to personalize it. I tell the truth. I feel this way. That's on the next Treasure Truth with Pastor and author James Ford Jr. Weeknights at 930 on 90.1 Moody Radio Chicago. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. Holding my baby as he struggled for every breath not knowing whether he'd have the strength to make it. When they rushed him into ICU, I was so scared. But I never felt alone. The Lord's presence was there with me. And the MediShare members were amazing. They took care of the doctor bills, they prayed, and they gave me peace when I needed it most. My son is doing great, praise God. How blessed we are to have the support of the MediShare community really reflecting the love of Christ. MediShare is a proud sponsor of Moody Radio. Learn how thousands of Christians can help you save on your health care. For your MediShare information guide, call 877-58-BIBLE. Not available in Kentucky or Montana. MediShare, affordable biblical health care. Call 877-58-BIBLE. That's 877-58-BIBLE. They serve our country in lonely, dangerous places. Their family members are left behind while they pray for their loved one's safe return. On the next Building Relationships with Dr. Gary Chapman, we'll honor our military. Three guests will talk about the relational difficulties and what you can do to aid families all around you. Don't miss the next Building Relationships with Dr. Gary Chapman. Saturday at noon here on 90.1 FM, Moody Radio, Chicago. I'm Julie Royce, and you're listening to Up for Debate. So what do you think of Christian Zionism? Does Israel have spiritual significance, and should Christians actively support it? I'd love to hear your thoughts this morning. Number to call, 877-LIVE-675. Or if you're unable to connect by phone, you can share your perspective on our Facebook page. You can connect by going to upfordebate.org and then clicking on the Facebook tab. Again, go to upfordebate.org and click on the Facebook tab. In just a minute, we'll continue our discussion on Christian Zionism. Zionism. <clears throat> First, though, I want to let you know that next Saturday we'll be discussing whether social media is damaging our souls. Some say Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, these all lead to a narcissism and exhibitionism that really hurts our souls. Others argue that this social media can build and enhance our social connections. So next week we'll discuss that topic uh, on Up for Debate at our same time, 8 a.m. Central Time. Well, returning to our topic this morning on Christian Zionism, uh, again, I have uh, Dr. Michael Brown with me and also Dr. Stephen Sizer. Uh, but I have a number of calls, and I want to give you a chance to uh, chime in as well. Let me go to Dave in Chicago. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, well point out that Genesis 12.3 has been a linchpin verse for Christian Zionists, if you will. That's the verse that says, uh, 
where God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I'd like each of your speakers to put on their, their Bible exposition hats and uh, tell me how they would interpret that verse based on their political perspective on Christian Zionism. Great question. Dr. Sizer? If you look very carefully at that promise in Genesis chapter 12, uh, it was a promise made to Abraham and nobody else. Um, there's nothing in that passage or anywhere else that says that it transfers to uh, a people. The emphasis uh, in, in the New Testament, especially in Romans, which Dr. Brown has mentioned, is a regathering to the Lord, not a regathering to the land. There is no precedent in Scripture for a regathering to the land in unbelief. The emphasis in, in the prophetic element of the Old Testament is um, warnings of, uh, of, ex, uh, of God expelling his people from the land because of their unfaithfulness. And, uh, and so any, any idea that the return to the land in 1948, which clearly was the result of uh, a political expediency on the part of Britain, who wanted to exit strategy, we gave half the land to the Jews and half to the Palestinians. One side accepted it because they were being offered half of what they didn't have. The other half rejected it because they were being offered half of what they already had. Um, it's a fact of history, and I defend Israel's right to exist. Um, as, as a nation state today. That's not the issue. The issue is trying to interpret it from Scripture. And going back to Genesis 12, it was a promise made to Abraham and nobody else. Okay. Dr. Brown? Yeah, just interpreting it from a biblical Semitic viewpoint, here's what it says, verse 2, I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, so you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, him who dishonors you, I'll curse. There's no question that, that this includes the future. I'll make of you a great nation. I will bless you. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. So, of course, it has ongoing relevance to the, the Jewish people. That's why it's reiterated in Jeremiah 30 and 31 that, that God would judge those who severely uh, punished Israel when they were scattered. The same thing in Zechariah, the first chapter. So we actually see this reinforced elsewhere in, in the Old Testament. And again, to correct Dr. Sizer, we have absolute precedent for return to the land in unbelief, Ezekiel 36. He says, I'll bring you back to the land in your uncleanness, and I'm doing it because of my name, because he said my name is being blasphemed. What's bizarre to me is that someone who's a Christian minister, and with me, we share our profound gratitude to the grace and mercy of God, and are utterly beholden to that, can't recognize God dealing with Israel the same way, in grace and mercy, not based on our works, but based on his work. And just as he worked through Cyrus, and, and the Persians to regather the Jewish people 2,500 years ago. He's worked through Britain and UN and America and other nations, but it's his hand at work. And once more, I ask the simple question, if God scattered us in judgment and you cannot reverse what he does, who regathered us if not for God? Okay, so much on the table right now, but I want to go back to our phone lines. I have Tracy on the line from South Florida. Good morning, Tracy. Oh, good morning. I didn't think you guys were going to get to me. <laughs> it's your lucky day. <laughs> All okay, right, Tracy, guess, what's your comment? Yeah, I guess I'm just a little flabbergasted with um, both of your guests. One, the minister seems to be in denial. And the second is that I did live in Israel. By the way, I attend a Messianic um, temple here in Florida. And um, I lived in Israel as a nanny, and I experienced rampant prejudice and racism against the Palestinians there. So, um, you know, it is there. They are being oppressed. I do support Israel being there. I believe it is God's plan. But I do get upset when I hear other people, some Jewish people that don't, will not acknowledge the rampant racism. They called them dirty. Um, the kids I took care of were absolutely hysterical when they found out I was going to go travel, take a vacation in Egypt. Um, they, they, it reminded me of how we treated African Americans during our racist period, like at its worst. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me, let me, uh, I would like Dr. Brown to respond to that, that there's racism existing in Israel. Well, certainly there is. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and one, one issue is that Israel is surrounded by hostile nations and that at any moment there are tens of thousands of missiles pointed at Israel and many people who want to kill them. But, of course, racism exists. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's undeniable. It's unforgivable. But it remains 
the minority, the, the majority. Uh, let's just remember you have a million and a half Israeli Arabs living side by side in, in the land. If, if folks go to my website, askdrbrown.org, click on latest video, uh, one of the videos has, has a, 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 an Israeli TV show where folks go into a coffee shop or this or that, an Arab, a woman in a burqa, and she says she wants to buy coffee, and the owner says, no, no, you're an Arab, I won't serve you. And there's outrage in the whole place. These Israelis that I'm not shopping here anymore, then I buy it for her. So that is the overwhelming sentiment. Is, is Israel a perfect nation? Far from it. That's something I rebuke Christian Zionists for all the time, this glorifying of Israel, this sentimentalizing of it. That's what I'm saying. Let's recognize God regathered the Jewish people. Let's recognize his prophetic purposes. And then let's stand together with Israel and call them to account for justice as we call the Palestinians to account the same way. So I appreciate the call. Uh, last thing I will say is I work with many, many in the land, Jewish believers, and they're constantly working with Arab brothers and sisters and constantly working for reconciliation. Yet Dr. Sizer says that Christian Palestinians who stand with Israel are denying Jesus Christ and an abomination. That's what's very troubling to me. Okay, Dr. Sizer? <laughs> I didn't say that. but um... No, I have the actual quote. I, I've listened to it. I've played it on my radio show. Right. So. What, what, can you just repeat the quote then, Toby, please? Sure, that there are Christian, I'll get it exactly here. There are certainly churches in Israel, Palestine that side with the occupation, that side with Zionism. Uh, they've repudiated Jesus, they've repudiated the Bible, and they are an abomination. Q&A at Rivercourt Methodist Church, King Street, Hammersmith, October 6, 2011. Dr. Sizer? Okay. I'm comfortable with that statement being true of some Christians and some churches that I've experienced. Uh, degrees of racism in Israel, Palestine, um, just as I have in the States, as I have in Britain. And I share with uh, Dr. Brown's uh, recognition that uh, racism exists in every every society. Um, the, the, you mentioned Ezekiel, um, Dr. Brown. In Ezekiel 33, uh, the, the Lord explicitly warns his people that because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience, that it would be arrogant to think that their possession of the land was a sign of his blessing. Uh, he warns specifically, Ezekiel 33, 24, 26, that he will make the land a desolate waste. And that's, that's indicative of uh, Amos, uh, Joel, Hosea, the other prophets. So my concern is I want Israel to be a safe and secure place for the Jewish people, I want to see peace and reconciliation with its neighbors. But if Israel continues uh, uh, in the course that it's going, I fear another exile from the land, and I do, do not want to see that. That's why I care passionately about Israel, but I oppose the direction Zionism is taking, which is becoming more extreme, more racist, and, and more uh, confrontational with its neighbors. Okay, Dr. Brown, you have about 30 seconds. Oh, the confrontation is provoked by the other side. Israel does what it does to keep murderers out of the land, to keep terrorists out of the land. Radical Islam, Islamic theology, is fueling the region. Let's look what's happening in Syria. Let's see what happened in Libya, Yemen, these other countries. The same with the, those surrounding Israel, including Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Let's be realistic about this. Let's side with Israel for the sake of justice and stand with them, call into account for the good of the Palestinians as well. And let's recognize that the God who scattered is the God who regathered. Only he could do it. Well, in Genesis 17, God does say to Abraham, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. And then again, as we referenced this morning, God affirms his covenant with Abraham. In Romans, the Apostle Paul says, referring to the Jewish people, as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. So yes, I believe we Gentiles have been adopted into God's family, share in the blessings of Israel, but I think God still has a unique purpose for the Jewish people and for Israel. Does this mean that we should support every policy of Israel? Of course not. We can support a nation without supporting all of its policies, and we should remember the Palestinian people, but I think we should recognize what God has done with Israel. That's my view. Love to hear yours. Up for debate at moody.edu. Have a great Saturday.